The Joyful Friar podcast is made possible by the generous support of our friends. To support the podcast, please visit nathan-castle.com and donate today. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Joyful Friar podcast. I'm Father Nathan Castle, your host. Today we're in part two of a three-part trilogy around the person of Omi. We called him Child Soldier, the friend you hadn't met until now. He His is the first story in book three, my uh, latest book in the Afterlife Interrupted series. In last week's podcast, I told his story, so you could circle back around to hear that podcast if you didn't get it already. But um, in brief, Omi came in a dream. He showed me um, a scene of a boy pointing a gun out a window in a war-torn place and not shooting when he was being... Uh, demand people were demanding that he shoot but he didn't what it turned out to be was he was a 10 year old in a classroom in, of all boys in, in Iraq he was enjoying his life as best he could in a war zone he loved school he loved learning he admired his teachers suddenly the classroom was stormed by an armed militia of young men who weren't very much older than he was, maybe five years older. Uh, he said all the, the the males old enough to be proper soldiers had long since been conscripted into the military or brought into it in one way or another. They were going all the way down to 10-year-olds to turn them into uh, child soldiers against their will. He was abducted. He never saw his parents again. And he never really had a moment's peace. He was forced to learn how to handle a gun and uh, fire on demand. That was the that was the protocol. Well, the scene that he showed us in the dream, showed me in the dream, was um, pointing a gun out a slit of a window and seeing an adult woman who looked and saw him, saw him in the eye, and who said to him, put that thing down this is not who you are. He said, I knew that she wasn't an enemy combatant. She was an innocent woman who didn't deserve to be killed. So why would I shoot and kill her just because people over my shoulder are forcing me to? He said, I had very little freedom of any kind, but I did have the freedom to decide whether or not to pull the trigger. And I decided not to because it was the right thing to do. Well, he had hell to pay for that. The uh, people who were trying to force him into that way of life ridiculed him, called him a baby. Uh, they gave him the worst food, the worst chores to do. He said, fortunately for me, uh, my death came shortly after that incident. And so there wasn't a long time to make me suffer for not having shot the woman. So it was a broken, it, it really a, a, a heartbreaking story. Well, this episode is called, uh, of this trilogy, is called uh, Omi uh, Compassionate Response with stories that have been in the public long enough for people to email me or speak to me about what it evoked in them. Um, I'm used to having responses from people that I can, uh, that so I know what they're thinking. This one's not been out very long, so I don't have very much to go by, but I have my own response to it and what it stirred in me and my imagination, at least of what it might stir in you. I, there, I want to quote one line, uh, from Omi's story, you remember the way that this operates is we, there's, I receive a dream often of, of, of a violent death uh, or of somebody that crossed in a, in, in the midst of, uh, of violence. And we do, we, we help them along and make an afterlife upward movement. Then if we think we'd like to tell their story in public as I'm doing here, we go back a second time into protected prayer, not 
with curiosity, only with a simple yes or no question to ask. May we please use your story in a book or maybe tell it publicly. So we, when we go back a second time, sometimes almost all the time, we get uh, a really delightful follow-up of what's been going on in the life of this person we got to know and love earlier. One of the things that Omi said was uh, when we were asking about maybe use your story, he said, I'm, my answer is yes. I'm honored that you would want my story in a book. I know that I'm the only child soldier that I, he, he, that Father Nathan has dealt with out of more than 500 of these stories. And then listen to this. Your country hasn't had war fought on its soil in a very long time. The problem of children being stolen and forced into soldiering at a young age could be something you pay little attention to. It's something that happens in chaotic places far away. Well, yes, that's true, Omi. But the uh, title of this episode of this middle part of a trilogy is compassionate response. And compassion means to suffer with. Suffering with means proximity next to, even if it is through some sort of remoteness. We can have compassion for people in our families who are at a distance. Um, I'm praying today for two, well, three different family and friend things because people frequently ask me to pray for someone's cancer surgery or somebody is near nearing their death. Um, I'll be doing a funeral very soon for another uh, extended family member. We don't have to be next to a person to uh, express compassion, to suffer with, without being next to. So the fact that Omi points out to an American audience, at least, that we haven't had war fought on our soil in a very long time, and it might be, it might seem to us that a problem of of children being abducted into soldiering uh, is something that you pay little attention to that happens in chaotic places far away. Well said, Omi. So I, I've been praying and thinking on it and um, thinking about how do we who live in places of uh, peace and perhaps plenty, how do we suffer with child soldiering, for example. Well, there are a lot of, of charities that have been organized for people in this country, at the very least, to uh, financially support efforts that are on the scene or on the spot. Having grown up Catholic, I can remember in childhood in our, in our school classroom at Catholic school, we were very often doing some sort of drives to raise money for hungry children somewhere. There were always somebody, something in the news where there was a famine or uh, something brought out on by war or hardships of different kinds where, uh, where children in particular were suffering. And we as children were taught we could help the children in another place. And one of the ways was to raise money to be able to buy food or uh, medical supplies or things like that. So I was thinking of those. I wonder if that touches your heart at all. If you are somebody who has a compassionate response to Ami's story, let me ask you this. Is there anything in your philanthropy that matches any part of his story? Uh, I watch some television and I absorb media and so on. And there are many uh, ads for different kinds of charities uh, in this country and around the world where the suffering of children is, is in, in the forefront. Feed the children. I just saw something about that one the other day. And many of these charities uh, ask, would you please consider a gift? A lot of them do $19 a month. Some uh, development professionals must have figured out that that's kind of the sweet spot, that that people might go for $19 a month. For only $19 a month, your uh, steady donation will accomplish these goals. 
you must have seen some of those where they will also um, do some sort of philanthropic adopt a child where they'll will send you a photo of, of this uh, this child wherever they are and uh, as a reminder that when you make your donation this is helping this specific child move through the difficulties that they're in have you ever done that or has it just kind of gotten lost in the um, the clatter of everything going on, and and especially of uh, many you know beneficial requests for funds? Um, anyway, I just wondered if if that is something that might touch your heart, that might move resources from a wealthy country like this one to to some chaotic scene somewhere else where children are are particularly hurt i'm i'm thinking back on my a family story my mother's father emigrated to the united states from hungary when he was 4 years old i lived near the international border with mexico uh, here in tucson in southern arizona and here in town uh we have a, a an, uh, an offshoot of Catholic charities that is the primary place where uh, persons who've crossed the border are brought at least for a day or two before they uh, can get passage to wherever else in the country they might have family or loved ones to receive them. And a lot of the churches that I help out at here in town have um, active uh practical things happening like making sandwiches and sorting clothes and things that that are not difficult to do that people can do at their own pace or maybe in a small group i wonder if there's something like that near you uh for something that benefits uh children thinking of how uh we're related i believe we're universal people that we're related not just to those who are in proximity to us, but we really are one um, universe. That's why it's called uni. Uh, is there uh, is there something that you could do that does touch on an international level? And the thing that comes to me is is funding. Uh, I've I've been in disaster scenes before, and uh, you hear it all the time after tornadoes or hurricanes or earthquakes. What's most needed is money. You know, yes, it's good for the bottled water to show up or uh, you know other things, but uh, but those who are skilled in uh, in disaster response often know how to get the practical stuff. They just need the money to pay for it. So that's one thing. Then I'm wondering too if there are suffering children who are around you, maybe maybe not even suffering, but just in need of something that you might be able to provide. One of the things that um, Omi was told was that some of the people who were helping him in the afterlife, some were angels, uh, some, but some were human souls who had also been children in war who decided what he called to circle back around because of their experience of what he had been through to come back around and help him up i've wondered if is there any if you were to sit down and pray about it and ask the holy spirit however you do that the breath of god the higher power what experiences did i have in my youth even if it was long ago that might somehow circle back around and be valuable is there something i learned how to do or know how to do that i could teach a child how to do you know, gardening, maybe, or something having to do with fixing things or, you know, tools or uh, practical skills of different kinds. Is there something that uh, where I could mentor? Uh, and I'm conscious that I've been around schools a lot. And very often, schools have some sort of auxiliaries. Very often, it's parent teacher, but not always. They, they're they sometimes looking for uh, classroom aides or um mentors of some kind sometimes it's to help with reading or math sometimes it's in after school programs is there something that you might do in through a local school or maybe a community center there might be some sort of community center near you um i, I particularly love seeing ones where they've matched 
uh, elder folk with with really little ones. I I had some friends that used to do a cuddling ministry in a hospital. There were children that were very ill, some of whom were probably not going to survive, and they had a team of people who did nothing but hold and rock them. Um, libraries are often looking for some kind of, um, of volunteers to do programming directed towards children, parks, oftentimes athletic things. I'm just wondering, is there anything that you might be able to do pretty close at hand? Churches are, are I know the church world, churches often need volunteers to do something with children's programming. Uh, sometimes it's catechetical uh, teaching, Sunday school kind of stuff. And other times it's what's well, just keeping kids uh, happy and, and accompanied. Back in college, I did uh, kind of a big brother, big sister program for a short time. Wondering about all those things. One of the things that Omi brought up was that he was a 10-year-old boy, but he was being bullied by these people who stole him and forced him to be a soldier. And they kept calling him and his peers sissies or babies if they didn't shoot and kill or do whatever it was their, their tormentors wanted them to do. He was really wise and he said, I was a 10 year old and I cried not because I was a baby or a sissy. I cried because I was lonely. I was hungry. I was away, stolen away from my family. I had lots of reasons to cry. Uh, he said they tried to make him feel ashamed of being a 10 year old boy because 10 year old boys aren't men and you're being a baby and not a man. But he kind of stood his ground at least in his own heart and said, no, what I am is a 10-year-old boy. I don't have to become a man by uh, shooting and killing somebody or forcing them to do what I want them to do because I have a gun pointed at them. Is that manhood? He was a 10-year-old thinking those thoughts. No, I, I might know, might not have the experience yet of being a man, but I know that this is not it. I don't want to be that man. I wonder if, if uh, is there any area in your life where hazing is tolerated, any uh, groups or organizations where that's just the way it is, that people have to go through some ordeal in order to move along. Uh, his guardian angel mentioned that the the abductors were had been through a process similar to what they were putting Omi through, that it was hazing. Is there any place where you could stand uh, in the breach and not let that kind of thing go on from one generation to the next? Um, I wonder if you have a prayer practice that uh, includes um, some sort of advocacy in the way that you act as a, a voter, as a member of a, a democratic community. Do you pay attention to uh, the needs of children who don't get a vote? Uh, and is that important when you uh, vote for all kind of things, uh, not not just at the you know national level of presidents and senators and so on, but all the way down the line to to very local uh, places. Do you pay attention to what appear to be needs of um, of children near you or in your community? And does your voting uh, advance their good? Do you pay attention to people in your community that would probably love to meet you and help you um, at least test the waters of some sort of volunteerism? There's some um, kind of niche ones too. I mentioned having been a big brother when I was in college. Yeah, I live in a university and there are particular uh, c communities or nonprofits that ask for retired professors to circle back around and do some volunteer uh, mentoring. There's some programs for uh, elders that involve doing service projects, some in this country and some not. Uh, think of stuff like Doctors Without Borders, where people, you know, intentionally, <clears throat> pardon me, intentionally leave the comfort of their home to go where there, there's a need. Well, there's some organizations that do that um, 
sort of like the Peace Corps, there are a number of of one's organizations for young adults who might during their college years or right after graduation, take a summer or a year to do some uh, volunteer work, much of which could be for uh, children in some kind of need. I think I might be belaboring this, but you get the point. If you have, uh, if, if Omi's story has touched you and you wish you could do something to make the world better for, um, children that are suffering, there's probably a way for you to do it pretty close at hand. So that's it for this episode. The, the third in this trilogy will be um, spiritual practices that might arise from the story of Omi, the child soldier, what he called, he, as he referred to himself, the friend you hadn't met until now. So that's for next time. But for now, I'm Father Nathan Castle. Grateful that you joined me. Remember that I am grateful for your interest in this podcast and in the work that I do, some of which is expressed in these books. Um, but remember, I'm praying for you. I have a, a, a significant part of my prayer life where I just pray for whoever you are, wherever you are, that the Lord who loved you into existence and knows your heart of hearts will be trying to provide for you the thing that would most uh, heal and most delight you. So God bless you. Bye-bye. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Joyful Friar. Please like, follow, and subscribe. You can visit me at nathan-castle.com. Send me a message by clicking the contact button. God bless.